So today, love rediscovered. Let me give you a, a little quiz, okay, as we start. Here's the first question. How many times does the word love appear in the Bible? If you have the NIV translation, how many times does it appear? 759, 551, 624, 327. Can you tell me? You're not, you didn't count? You haven't counted how many times? Well, it's, it is 759. Yes. Okay, next question. Finish the verse. We love because... This one here? Are you sure it's not because you need something? Or maybe that you are lovable? Okay, or maybe we are commanded to love. You're right. It's because he first loved us. Yes. Here, when the word love... When was the word love first mentioned in the Bible? First mention of the word love is in the introduction, right? In the, no, no. It's in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. It says there, God said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac. Notice, that's the word love. It comes out. And this is the love between a father and a son. Just like God's love for his son, Jesus, and for us. Next question. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only what? A resounding gong. Not a blabbermouth, huh? I'm not talking to myself. Or human. Okay, you're right. It's a resounding gong. The definition of love. You know, many people try to define it, but there's such a vast Many different de definitions. Here's one. Oh, there's one more. Who are the neighbors the Bible speaks about in the command to love your neighbor as yourself? Tell me. People live next door? People, the person sitting next to you in church? The jeepney and motorcycle driver? Everyone in the world. Yes, everyone in the world. So here's the definition. Love is the feeling that you feel when you feel a feeling like you've never felt before. Tama, no? Ang galing How about this one? You know that tingling little feeling that you get when you love someone? That is your common sense leaving your body. Okay. I like this one. Love is not something that you define. It's a decision. It truly is a decision. Here in CCF, we talked about love last week with Pastor Peter, and we talked about love is from God. Everyone, an unconditional commitment towards imperfect people to seek their highest good, which may require sacrifice resulting to the glory of God. If you notice, you have God in the start and God at the end. God is in both sides. Now, the passage we're going to look at today is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Can I ask you all to rise so we read the Word of God together? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Read it out loud, huh? Verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, endure, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Father, we join our hearts as we open your word today, and we want to say thank you for your unconditional love for each and every one of us. Father, where would we be without you? We know, Lord God, that many times we fail you, and yet you continue to love us to no end. Thank you, Lord God, for the assurance that 
you'll never let us go. You'll never forget us. Thank you, Father, that we can learn to be more loving like your son Jesus. Today, Father, as we open your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. That if there's any area in our lives that needs building up in terms of love, Lord, would you be the one to convict us and help us realize how we can grow in our, in our love. We thank you, Lord God, that you are the best and only example of true love. We love you, Lord God, and pray all of this in the precious and wonderful name of your Son, our Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Please be seated. First Corinthians chapter 13. Friends, the title of our message is Love is Action. Could you all say that? Love is action. Now, notice, huh? love is action. But this love that we have, that acts, doesn't come from us. This is God's love in and through us that acts. Are you with me? It's God's love that we use to pass on to others. Now, many people, when you talk about God, God they say, you know, God is a concept. God is an idea. We don't know who God is. And it's true, if you look at 1 John 4, it says, no one has ever seen God. And the, the majority of the world will agree with this because we've never seen God. And to them, they can't grasp who is God. How, how can you know there is a God? How can I believe in a God? You can share the gospel, you can share all kinds of things from the word of God, but people cannot really hold and get a handle of who God is. But look what it says next. It says, but if we... Love one another. Friends, that's the killer. That really changes everything. If we love one another, God lives where? In us. And his love is made complete in us. God becomes a reality as we love one another. It becomes real. People see that in us. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this, everyone will what? Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Are you the disciple of Jesus? I didn't hear you. Are you the disciple of Jesus? You really have to ask yourself that question because if you are, then people will know that you are his disciple if you love one another. You see, let me tell you, doctors can practice their profession without loving their patients. Teachers can teach in classrooms without loving their students. Businessmen can run their business without loving their clients. But a Christian cannot live his or her Christianity without loving one another. Without loving one another. Friends, you and I are the billboards of God. Look what it says. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant that. You see, you and I are God's billboard. We are here on this earth to show people, to declare who God is through our words and our actions. How else will people know? So he's put you here for that purpose. But you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, me? I, I just, I can't, I, I can't even follow God's love. I can't live God's love. And that's absolutely true. You can't. You can't. There was a woman who was telling her friend, it's because of you that I committed my life to Jesus Christ. Her friend said, really? Well, I'm so grateful to hear that, but tell me, how did God use me? What did I say that, that brought you to Christ? And the friend said, no, it's nothing about what you said. I happened to be standing around when I saw a person criticize you and insult you face to face, and I watched how you responded in kindness to that person, at that moment I knew that what you had was real. You and I are the living billboards of God, and we need to proclaim who God is through the actions of our lives. Are you with me? Love in action. Two points. Our motive of love and our model of love. 
our motive and our model. If you look at our world today and the society that we live in, there's so much conflict. There's so much fighting. There's so much killing. There's so many battles going on. And you wonder, what's happening to this world? The experts will tell you there's a problem. And the problem is that people lack education. If people are educated, there will be no more fighting. There will be no more killing and, and conflicts. What do you guys think? What's the solution to this world? The solution is love. It is. That's the solution that we need, love. Even if you and I cannot in ourselves follow God's love, God gives us His Holy Spirit. God gives us His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit living in us changes us. Look at this. The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is love. It goes on. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, all from love. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you have the Holy Spirit, friends, you have the ability to live out God's love through the fruit, through the fruit that overflows in your life. It, it's just a natural byproduct. Loving one another is not natural. We don't naturally love one another. No. That's why we need the supernatural power of God in our lives to be able to love others the way God does. The question is, are you giving the Holy Spirit control over your life? Or are you taking control? Is self in control rather than the Spirit of God? Love is action. Point number one, our motive of love. Could you all say that? Our motive of love. The motive is crucial. It's so key. Look at this. The world, the love of the world is based on feelings. The love of the world is towards the lovable. The love of the world is physical intimacy. The love of the world is giving to receive. Do you agree? That's the love of the world. And it's all based on the motive. What's their motive? Their motive is, is selfishness and self-interest. Because that is how the world loves. All of us, we have that same sinful nature. And it's got to change. 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. It's the love according to Paul. And it's a perfect example because this church had problems. You, you name problems, they had the problems. They had divisions, different uh, sections, carnality, quarrels, gross immorality, court cases, boasting of spiritual giftedness, rebelliousness, chismes and marites. It was all there. This is the Corinthian church. A lot of problems. But the answer to their problem is love. That was the answer. And so Paul was teaching the Corinthians as a church, listen, this is what you need. This is what you need. He says in chapter 12, verse 31, the last verse about spiritual gifts. Now earnestly desire the greater gifts. So he talked about all the gifts, how all of us are given gifts to serve one another in the body. But he says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. As he closes this topic on spiritual gifts, he now moves to the second topic. A more excellent way. What, what way is that? That's the way of love. That's the way of love. Then he continues by saying in verse 1 of chapter 13, If I, Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, tongues of men and angels, these are different languages, okay? Now, we don't have to debate on this, but angels, we don't really know what that is. But whatever it is, it's, whatever it is, it's speaking without love. It says, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You have to understand, in the first century, in pagan temples, at the entrance, there was this huge gong, okay? And this huge gong. And these gongs, if the people wanted to worship, they would go there and they would strike the gong. They'd just... Imagine the delay. Okay, now. Why would they strike the gong? Because they wanted to wake up the gods to listen to their prayers. That's why. Now, Paul is saying, 
if I speak with great eloquence, if I'm blessed with such a wonderful message for people, if I can share all these nice things about Christianity and spirituality, but I don't have love, it's worthless. It's useless. It's so ridiculous. It's like banging that gong to wake up non-existent gods. It's not worth it. He says, love is greater than speech. Love is greater than speech. He goes, well, a great speaker can move a person's emotions. A great, and great words can move a person's mind. A great speech can move a person's will. But... Only great love can move a person's heart. Only great love. Today, friends, in your workplace, with your families, with your friends, in your school, wherever you are, you can talk and talk and talk all about God. But if you don't have love, it's meaningless. It's meaning talk is cheap without love. He goes on. To say, if I have the gift of prophecy and all and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. What's he saying here? If he has the gift of prophecy, he has the ability to, to declare God's word. He knows God's word to encourage other people. If he has that gift, Know all mysteries. If he has, if he had understanding of the secrets, the deep thoughts of, of the Bible. If I have all knowledge, can you imagine all knowledge? He can answer the most difficult questions that you present to him. He's a good apologist. He knows theology. And if I have all faith, can you imagine being able to move mountains with faith? If I have all this, but do not have love, he says, I am nothing. So, friends, even if you know the entire Bible, even if you read it cover to cover, even if you know about so many things like nuclear medicine, physics, psychology, uh, physiology, anthropology, theology, and all the other ologies, friends, none of that is of any consequence unless you have love. You can show all these knowledge, but friends, love is greater than spirituality. It goes on. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. What Paul is saying here is that love is more important than faith. Did you hear me? Love is more important than faith. That doesn't make sense to some people. How can love be more important than faith? Isn't faith the most important thing? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And yet, friends, listen. Do you have faith? Yes, you have faith, right? But what good is your faith if you do not exercise it with love? It is love that causes a person to pray with other people. It's love that causes you to care for others. It's love that causes you to, to want to share the gospel to other people. Friends, remember, faith is of no value without love. It's of no value without love. As a matter of fact, in Galatians 5, 6, he says, the only thing that counts is faith, what? Expressing itself through love. There you have it. Love is more important than faith, but faith is just as important because you need faith in God. Because the faith in God gives you the ability to love like God. Here in verse 3, it says, And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Notice it says, if I give all my possessions, not just 10%, but if you empty out your savings account, if you give up your retirement fund, if you give up your home, everything you own to the poor, but don't have love, it's worthless. These are people who are doing this act with motives. The motive is to impress other people. The motive is to gain praises of others. Remember Ananias and Sapphira, the book of Acts chapter 5? Apparently, they sold the property and then they went to the church and they gave the money to the church, thinking that... No one would find out that they kept half for themselves. Their motive was to get the praise from the people in the church. But when the church found out the truth, they were punished by God. Today, generosity is very nice. It's very wonderful to be generous. But why do you give? Why do you give? Do you give because 
you're pressured? Do you give because you feel guilty? Do you give because you, you want to impress other people? Friends, the only reason why you should give is because you love God so much. You love God and you want to help other people with no conditions. That's the motive. That's the right motive. And by the way, here in CCF, you guys give tremendously. And I praise God for all of your hearts. So he goes on to say, if I surrender my body to be burned. Can you imagine? That's the ultimate sacrifice. Martyrdom. Dying for your faith. He says, but do not have love. Let's not go so far. Let's not go so far. For example, if, uh, if every time the church doors are open, you're here in church. When it comes to Bible studies, you're at the Bible studies, D groups. You're reading your Bible every day. You're going to, to Bible studies all the time. But if you don't have love, friends, all of that is useless. It's worthless. In other words, love is greater than sacrifice. Love is greater than sacrifice. Great speech, great spirituality, great sacrifice. All of the above plus no love equals nothing. It equals nothing. What is your motive, friends? And we need to pause and pray, reflect. Is my love driven by selfish motives? Is my love today driven by selfish motives? Are there conditions, expectations, strings attached to my love? Because if there are, then people cannot see it, but God sees it. And that's what's most important. What's the application to us? Love is action. Our motive of love, the application is, in all that we do for others, we ought to love without any expectations. I pray that our love would reach this limit, this point that I'm not expecting anything in return. We continue. Our model of love. Can you all say that? Our model of love. There was a young son who asked his dad, Dad, can you tell me, what does a Christian look like? And the father said, oh, son, a Christian is one who loves and obeys God. A Christian is one who, who loves his friends, his neighbors, and his enemies. A Christian is one who is kind, gentle, humble, holy. He loves, you know, thinking about heaven more than, than focusing on the earthly riches that this world has to offer. That's a Christian. The son looked at the dad and was a little confused. He thought for a minute, then he said, Dad, have I ever seen a Christian? Our model of love. What are we modeling to others? Now, wait, wait. Something's missing. What's missing here? What's missing? You're right. But not only love. What's also missing is your name. Your name. Can you imagine later on this afternoon sitting down, Reading this passage, when, when, you see, when you see the word love, you change it. You put your name there. You know, Joby is patient. Joby is kind. Joby is not just... Can you imagine putting your own name here? <sighs> True test of love. In this passage, there are 15 verbs. They sound like adjectives, Right? Descriptions, but no, these are verbs. These are action words. Every single one of these that are underlined. These action words are in the present tense, which simply means that it doesn't happen once and it's over. No, you're being patient, you're being kind, not just, and all that. That is not just a one day, one week, one month. No, it's, it's a lifetime. This should be our, our natural default. This should be our lifestyle. This should be a habit. It should be ingrained in us. This is how we live. Can you imagine? A good friend of mine was married three times before he became a Christian. When he became a Christian, he was so convicted about his life. He says, you know what? I, I don't know what love is. I mean, look how many wives I've had. I've, I just lived a wrong life. So he studied this passage over and over daily. He just kept studying this passage, reading it, reading it over again. Until finally, he came to understand what true love is. He went to his first wife and he told his first wife, I want to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for how I treated you, 
for everything that happened in our relationship, I was at fault. He went to the second wife and he told her the same thing. With the third wife, he endeavored to be a better husband, to make sure that what happened in the first and second marriage would not happen in the third. And true enough, his marriage with the third wife was beautiful. They both committed their lives to Christ. Their children changed. It was a beautiful, transformed life. Put your name here and see how far you can go. But I also want us to do something. I also want us to, to rate ourselves, okay? Rate yourself in love. How loving am I towards others? Now, don't rate the person sitting next to you. Don't rate your spouse. Don't rate your children, okay? Just rate yourself. That's all you do. Rate yourself, okay? One to ten. Ten, you're like Jesus. One, you're like, I don't, you're, you're down. Thumbs down, okay? Now, if you're between seven to nine, just keep improving. Don't stop. If you're five and six, don't stay here. Don't stay here. Now, if you're two to five, two to four, see God ASAP. All right? See him right away. It's important. So keep rating yourself as we go through each one of these. Let's go to the first one. Love is patient. Can you all say that? Love is patient. Now, I want you to say your name and then is patient. Okay? Out loud. Ready? Go. Joby is patient. Again, again, you're not convinced. Ready? Go. Now I hear you. Is that true? Wait, wait, wait. I'll tell you that I have difficulty with this. Wow. Of all of these, like, patience, why is that number one? That's the one I struggle with the most. You know, I've been praying for patience for the longest time, and I think I'm going to stop. I can't wait anymore. Okay. <laughs> love is patient. Now, this love is not just love. This is what they call agape love, God's unconditional love. Can you imagine? That's the standard. Agape love is patient. You might be living with people today who are hard to live with, and it calls for patience. Patience. You know what the Greek word for patience is? The Greek word is makrothumeo. Can you all say that? Makrothumeo. Now, you know what makro is, right? Makro is not, not the place that you go shopping, okay? Makro means long. Can you all say long? Long. And the second part, thumeo, is what? Suffering. So this is long suffering. Here, say it with me. Long suffering. Can you do that? Long-suffering? It's not easy, right? Well, consistently overlooking, delay, trouble, or suffering without, notice, without allowing anger to control our emotions against others because we know God is in control. Are people perfect? No. Are you perfect? No. <laughs> Who said yes? <laughs> we are not perfect, right? And so therefore... When people do not meet your expectations, give them grace. Give them grace. Don't be so hard on them because God is still in control and he's still working in their life. I'll tell you a story about this uh, father, but before that, let me just say, patience makes a believer believable. Patience makes a believer believable. And patience is a matter of our trust in, our, in his power. Our trust in his power. True story. This uh, father was on a train. Oh, before that. Patience test. Be patient. Patience test. Are you ready? I'll just give you a few of them, and then you tell me uh, which one you can check off. You frequently lose your temper when a person can't follow your instructions. Yes? No? Okay. In your own mind, okay? Check it off. Number two. You are late for church, but your parents need five more minutes to get dressed. This one, you interrupt your spouse when, they talk, when they're talking and say, just give me the bottom line. How about this? This one, you ask yourself during a sermon, how much longer is this preacher going to talk? <laughs> Guilty, ba? Okay. Love is kind. How did you rate on patience? One to ten. All right, next. Love is kind. Now, kind is such a small word. Kind. And yet the power behind kind, kindness is so amazing. Kind is, is looking for opportunities to do things for others. 
without any conditions, kind, extending generosity, goodwill, blessing, and empathy. Notice, empathy to those who are difficult, demanding, and even challenging to us. I know you have these kind of people in your life, but kindness thinks of what can I do. Most of the times we think kindness is what's in it for me. We think about that. When it comes to love, what's in it for me? But no, with kindness, it's how can I serve this person? How can I better serve this person? There's a father who was on a train, and he had three children who were unruly. They were crying. They were running all over the place. He couldn't control them. And the passengers around were infuriated. They were so irritated because they couldn't rest with all this noise going on. And they wanted to go to the father and say, can you please control your kids? But you know, one passenger stood up, went to the father and says, having a tough day? And the father shook his head. And the man says, do you need some help? And the father says, yes. My wife, the mother of these children, just died the other day. And I'm taking them to see her parents. When that man heard the condition of this father, he understood the situation. He put himself in the man's shoes and realized with compassion that it's not for us to judge others and condemn them without understanding what they're going through. He showed kindness by taking one of the children and caring for that child. Kindness. It says in Romans 2, verse 4, or do, you not, or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? God's character is kindness and patience. Tolerance and patience is the same thing. God's character is kindness and patience towards us. And that kindness and patience leads us to repentance. I look at my life and I think, God, you're patient with me? How could you be patient with me? He sent his son to die on the cross and that was a demonstration of his love. And I didn't surrender my life right, right away. No, it took years before I surrendered my life. And yet God was patient. He was kind during all that time. Whenever I feel that this person doesn't deserve kindness or love, because they don't deserve it. I think about God's kindness and patience with me. It changes my heart. It says, love is what? Not jealous. Now, Paul talks about the, the knots of love. The knots of love. These are eight of them. Okay, The opposite of what love is. He says, love is not jealous. Now, realize that in, when it comes to jealousy, there are two types of jealousy. One is good. Okay? The jealousy of God. Or, for example, when you want to protect your family, you want to protect your marriage, you're jealous to the point that you want to uh, maintain the sanctity, the purity of your marriage from any immorality. That's a good jealousy. But the jealousy that's talked about here is a selfish type of jealousy. When you see other people successful, when you see other people doing so much better than you, you get jealous. That's not love. When you look at your Facebook feeds and you see your friends, you know, traveling to different places, eating in different restaurants, you know, having parties with friends, and you're just watching it all through Facebook, how do you feel? Do you celebrate their success or do you frown upon it? Friends, jealousy. We ought to be happy for others when they are blessed. Do not hesitate to celebrate other success. That's love is not jealous. In the case of Joseph, his brothers sold him to slave traders. They were so jealous of Joseph because Joseph had a dream and was saying that God had spoken to him and, and this is going to happen in the future. They were so jealous they sold him to slave traders. And then you have King Saul who was so jealous of David, he tried to kill David. When people started admiring David for slaying ten thousands and King Saul slaying thousands... They praised David, and King Saul did not like that, to the point that he chased David for 14 years in the wilderness, trying to kill him. That's 
the hatred. And this is what happens. If you maintain this jealous spirit, look at the verse says, James 3.16. Let's read it together. Where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is what? Disorder, unrest, rebellion, and every evil thing. Jealousy is dishonoring to God. It is a sin that God does not want, and it will ruin your life. Verse 4 says, love does not brag and is not arrogant. The word brag is where you, you talk in a conceited manner, trying to bring yourself across as being superior to others. Conceited. It's conceit. Brag is what in Tagalog? Yes, that's right. That's what brag is. And then you have arrogant. Arrogant is where you puff yourself up. You make yourself as if, you know, you're so proud of what you have. But listen to this. Everything we have, everything we've done, everything we've accomplished, everything we've achieved is only by the grace of God. He gives us the ability to do all of that. And so love does not brag and is not arrogant. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course... As long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Pride. Many politicians, not all, but some politicians like to put their, their name and pictures on billboards when they're building a bridge, they're widening a road, they're putting up a basketball court, you know, just to show that, hey, look what I'm doing. But you know the truth is? Where does that money come from? It comes from your pockets. Yes, it comes from your pockets if you pay tax. Now... The Duke of Wellington, he says, God knows I have many faults, but being wrong is not one of them. Ay, proud talaga. Love is not parading yourself. Love is not running to the limelight, the spotlight. Love is not you're seeking attention, seeking accolade. No. Love is, is attributing all the glory to God because he alone deserves it. This is Paul, his description of himself. He says in 1 Corinthians that he's the least of the apostles. The least of the apostles. And then in Ephesians, he says, I'm the least of the saints. And then in 1 Timothy, he says, I'm the worst of sinners. Amazing. The apostle Paul who did so much in spreading Christianity throughout the, the world. He calls himself all these things. That's his assessment of himself. Talk about bragging and arrogant. That was not Paul. Love does not act unbecomingly. Can you all say that? Love does not act unbecomingly. What is unbecomingly? We don't use that word, right? But the word is actually rude. You are brutal. You are, you are brash. When it comes to, to this type of love, you, you don't respect other people. Unbecomingly. Now, this, this lifestyle is where people are moody, you know, and oftentimes they, they live by their emotions. However they feel, that's what they, they live by. And moodiness is really a sin. It's very selfish. It's very selfish. It's, it's wanting attention, unbecomingly. And notice, it's a choice. It's a choice you make. Like for example, if you're having dinner and uh, your guest is Jesus Christ, how will you act? How would you act? Wouldn't you act with respect, with proper manners, with dignity? You, you'd be so, you know, different when Jesus is there. Now, I say it's a choice because sometimes if a husband and wife are having a heated argument and they're shouting at each other and all of a sudden the phone rings and the husband answers the phone and it's his boss on the line. What happens to the boss, the, the man? He says, oh, sir, good afternoon. Yes, oh, I'm here. Oh, everything's okay. No, no problem. He's so different. It's a choice that you make. Are you going to act rude, disrespectful, or gracious? It's a choice. Love does not make a fool of anyone, including yourself. Including yourself. Love does not seek its own. Can you all say that? Love does not seek its own. When it comes to seeking its own, this is self, your own self-interest. Love forgets self and does not get upset over not getting what one wants. Oftentimes, people are so selfish. 
a father decided to leave his family and to move in with a mistress into another home. That was his choice. He packs up all his bags and everything, and the family was in the living room. And before leaving, he goes up to his son and he kisses his son on the forehead and says, Son, I love you. And he's on his way out. Do you know what? That is not love. That's not love because the father did not love the son. He loved himself more. He was loving his, his freedom. He loves his pleasure. He loves himself much more than he loves his son. You see, when it says, does not seek its own. Love is an unconditional commitment towards imperfect people to what? Seek their highest good. To seek their highest good. We ought to look for ways to help people in their situation. I know some of you are saying to yourself right now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What if people abuse me? What if people take advantage of me? What if people trample over me and, and really make me bastos? What do I do? How do I, how do I respond? Friends, can I ask you, when that happens, does God know? Yes. Is God on your side? Will God protect you? Yes. Is God allowing that to happen for a reason? Yes. There's no, no uh, issue if you talk to that person and say, you know what, what you said to me just now really is disrespectful. Or what you did to me a while ago really hurt me. Nothing wrong with saying that straight to that person. But at the same time, God allows these individuals in your lives to mold your character, to build your faith, to, to know that He is your God. So there are limits in the sense that you tell the person, don't cross this line, please. I want to love you. I want to keep on loving you. But please don't step over the boundary. Set boundaries. But love endures. Love never fails. Love is not what? Provoked. The word provoked, we don't use that very often, but it's the word sharp. It's a picture of, of a blade, you know, piercing us. It's sharp. It, it causes us pain. It causes us to get angry. Being provoked is love does not lose its temper and express anger. That's what it's talking about here. Love does not lose its temper or express anger. When the time comes that you are having an argument with your wife or your husband or your children, oftentimes, you know, the tone escalates and, and you're, you can't even hear each other anymore. You know what I do? A little tip. I'll tell you, this is what you can do also. Just two words. Walk away. Okay? That's what you can do. But let me tell you, before you walk away, you tell the person, you know, we're not getting into this argument. We're not getting anywhere. So if you don't mind, I want to step aside and I want to pray. I want to pray. And you pray and you come back and you settle it. But at the moment, in the heat of the argument, don't push it. Don't force it. Step aside. Step aside because love is not provoked. Love is not provoked. Father and his son were talking and having an argument. And the father says, you know, you're making me mad. And the son says, dad, 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 remember, I don't make you mad. You choose to be mad. Is that true? We choose to be mad. Love is not provoked. Again, love does not take into account a wrong suffered. What does this mean? When it says does not take into account, this word into account is a, an accounting term. It's like having a ledger of all the, the different faults, mistakes, and sins of another person. So love does not keep any record of wrongs. Do you keep a list of records of wrongs of others? You know, in Polynesia, there's this group of people that hang things in their doorway around the house. And those things remind them of their hate and anger towards certain people. And when they see those things, it fuels that anger. And they believe by having that anger, they're getting revenge. That's what they think. True story, there's a man who went on a rampage, killing, murdering several people. His office mate one of his family members, a uh, long-lost friend, etc. He was killing these people. And finally, he was the last victim. He killed himself. When the police found him, they discovered in his pocket he had a list, a long list of names of individuals who apparently some he had shot already. And this list were most definitely people who caused him hurt and pain. And he was getting revenge against these people. Today, friend, you might not have 
a physical list. But you might have a list in your mind. And that list is dangerous. Because if that list remains in your heart, it will build bitterness and anger and hate and revenge and so forth. Do you have a list in your heart? We went to a retreat one time. It was a couple's retreat. And during the breakout, men here, women here. And we were talking about this issue, about keeping records of wrong. And, and one of the men says, you know what? In my family, with my wife, every time she gets mad, she gets hysterical. Wow, the guy says, for you, hysterical? Well, for me, when my wife gets mad, she gets historical. She pulls out a list of all my past sins. So I was wondering, what's better, hysterical or historical? I don't know. But don't have those lists in your life. Think about this. In Psalm 130, verse 3, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities... Oh, Lord, who could stand? You know what this is saying? If God had a list of all of our sins, our iniquities, could you even face God? Wow, I would be so ashamed to stand before God with this list. And that's because God does not keep a list. Because it goes on further in this passage, in verse 11 and 12. So great is His loving kindness. Continue. Toward those who fear Him, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thank God that he's so loving, that he's chosen to set aside all of our sins from the east and the west. He's completely chosen to eradicate them and throw them so far that they'll never meet. Friends, Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind and what? Compassionate to one another. Continue. Forgiving each other. Just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. When I think about my life, how I surrendered my life to Christ and committed myself to Him, at that moment, He tore up the list of all my sins. They're all clean and gone. Today, I have the great forgiver who has forgiven me. And he's given me the power to forgive others. Who am I to withhold that forgiveness from others when God consistently, up to today, still forgives me? Understand, friends, forgiving is your choice. And forgiving is your freedom. It is your freedom. Love is an act of endless forgiveness. That's what love is. It's an act of endless forgiveness. Love, everyone, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. What does it mean to not rejoice with unrighteousness? Unrighteousness here are things that are done that dishonor God, that displease God, things that are against His holy standard. When people do that, this is all about sin. When people do that, we don't rejoice with them. We don't celebrate that they're sinning, that they're living a lifestyle of sin. No, we don't. We, but we rejoice with the truth. When a person overcomes a sinful lifestyle, we rejoice. When a person overcomes victory of temptation, we rejoice. Oftentimes, we focus on the failures and sins of people. When that shouldn't be our case, we should focus on their good side. Because everyone has a good and bad side. Let's face it. We should focus on the good side of people, not the negative side, but the good side. I remember when, when the life of David is, is chronicled in the Bible where he was a sinner, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer, all these things. And yet, in the New Testament, when God had him described, it says, David was a man after my own heart. God did not highlight the past he highlighted the present. This is who David is today. And likewise for us, we should not rejoice with unrighteousness, but rejoice with the truth. Love does not rejoice when others sin, but, when they, but they rejoice when they act according to the truth of God's word. Let me ask you, how are you doing in ratings? Are you in the 10 almost? Or are you in the... Never mind. Okay, 1 to 10, where are you there? 
You know what you can also do? If you're brave enough, okay, after you rate yourself, you sit down with your family, you tell your family, can you all rate me? I want you to rate me when it comes to patience, kindness, not being jealous, not bragging, not being arrogant, all of these things. It's nice to know because oftentimes we have blind, blind what? Spots. We have blind spots. Yes, thank you, Nettie. So, verse 7 and 8 says, Love bears what? All things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. As Paul concludes this brilliant expose on love, and this is not a definition of love, this is a decision to love. Love is action. He talks about bearing, believing, hoping, enduring, and love never fails. What I want to do is as we we close this part, I want us to apply this to our families. Because it it boggles me sometimes. Why are we so much more kind, patient, loving with strangers rather than with our own loved ones who are close to us? Why is that? So here when it comes to your family, when it talks about Love never gives up. When it says bears, bears all things, this means to roof over. Literally, to roof over, to cover and protect of others. Today, when your family members do things that are, that are not right, do you cover them by saying, you know what, I know you made a mistake, but I'm not going to cancel you. I'm not going to scratch you out of my list. I'm going to keep You protect it. I'm going to make sure that you're still part of our family. I'm not going to abandon you, throw you away. No, I'm going to protect you because I love you. They all make mistakes, and we make mistakes as well. Bears all things. And then believes, which means to put your faith in. To put your faith in, thinking the best of others. When a person does not live up to your expectations, can you give them the benefit of the doubt? Think of the best in their life. Believe that somehow they can change. Believe. That's what it is, to believe. And then hopes, which means to have confidence in. Have confidence in. Anticipates with trust what God will do. Here is where you are not hopeless when it comes to your family members. You're hopeful. Hopeful that God will somehow change their lives. You and I cannot change it, but maybe God can. God wants to change their lives. So be hopeful. And then endures. It means to stay under. To stay under. Keep going. Persevere with strength. As as our family members are going through difficult times in their own personal lives and they're interacting with us, we should likewise endure with them. Come alongside them. Lock arms with them. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Inspire them. Be there for them. Keep on going. Don't give up. Keep persevering with strength. That's what it means. Endures. Because love never fails. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 tells us, it gives us the answer. Because right now you're all thinking, you know what? Looking at this whole list of love, I fail. I cannot do it. It's impossible. And your question is, How can I possibly live this out? How can I live this out? I've got great news for you, friends. This is the answer of how you can live it out. Romans 5 5 says, God's love has been what? Poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Can you picture that? God's love, His infinite love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I look at our love. The love that we manufacture out of our own self is just like a little glass of water, filled with water. That's it. That's how big the amount of our love is. But if you compare that to God's love, I imagine God's love is like the Niagara Falls and more. It's just gushing. It's pouring. It's it's never ending. It's everlasting. It's just the source is, is forever. That is God's love. And that love of God, friends, it's been poured into your hearts. Through the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit in your life today, you have God's love overflowing through you. You and I just need to exercise it. We need to apply it. We need to live it out in our lives. Verse 8 tells us why. Why should we even bother doing this? 
It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, I don't deserve the death of Christ, but he, he loved me so much that he gave his life so that I might have life one day. And today, as you're faced with sinners, people who are not living up to your expectations, to your standards, friends, our love to them can be the same love exampled by God and his son, Jesus Christ, to love them to the end, to love them to the end. This afternoon, we're so privileged to have a sister who's going to share with us her testimony of how this applied in her life. Please welcome Edith Rocha. My name is Edith Rocha. In the year 1999, I heard the gospel of salvation, but I was too attached to a hopeful but immoral relationship to become legalized. For the next 10 years, God would start breaking every lofty thought and defense mechanism I had come to master. Even that was not enough, God took away for good the very source of my sin in 2009. And that was the start of my new life in Christ. I am the youngest among three siblings and we relate well with one another. 12 years ago, I offered a business engagement to my siblings to help them financially in their old age. That condition, however, was not to include the in-laws in every transaction, but keep it among us only to avoid any interference from them that might cause eventual filial problems. This seemingly good purpose somehow found its way to cause a rift in our relationship with my sister-in-law. In 2009, my sister-in-law started to question every detail of our business transactions, the amount deposited from my company in, and withdrawn amount from the bank where my older sister worked then. She questioned the integrity of my older sister when she failed to produce written documents as proof of withdrawals and exhaustively brought further grief to me when she disrespected my brother in front of our depository bank manager and staff. Finding her behavior rude and unkind, I too started to rationalize my growing dissent and anger towards her. For 12 long years, she remained incognito and disowned by me and my sister. We totally stopped every form of communication with her, neither birthday nor holiday greetings, and avoided seeing her when she is on vacation in the Philippines. My sister and I were indignantly proud of our cause. While we were growing apart in our relationship, that is my sister and I against my sister-in-law, the word of God grew stronger and deeper in my heart. The conviction of the Spirit of God became more intense and piercing that it deprived me of peace. God turned my scene of disobedience into mourning and relentlessly grieving my soul. God must have been so displeased by my unloving and destructive attitude and grieved his very spirit. On May 7, 2023, my brother came to see me before my flight back to the Philippines. As always, my sister-in-law was with him. Hard as I prayed for God to delay my meeting her, hoping to talk to her before the following year instead, which was 2024, God's will cannot be deterred. The encounter happened. God allowed my sister-in-law to open her pains and great disappointments of how she was made an outcast from what she believed was the family to her. God just kept me silent, and I ended up embracing her with the love and compassion of God. The Lord made me realize the gravity of the pain that I felt because of what my sister-in-law has said and done the past years was nothing compared to the excruciating pain Jesus suffered to pay for my sins on the cross. 
The Holy Spirit convicted me of my ungodly thoughts and unbecoming attitude as a believer in Christ, that I was compelled to ask forgiveness without any excuse, forgetting all my recited rational and reasonable justifications. Looking back, if God had not intervened, bitterness would have turned to rage and revenge, and then the Spirit of God will grow stranger to me. As Mark chapter 11 verse 25 says, And when you stand praying, if you hold against anything, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. These resonated in my heart and soul as I sought God's forgiveness after so many years of conflict and heartache within our family. My prayer then was that I would humbly seek my sister in forgiveness to bring about complete healing in our relationship. By doing this, I would be able to boldly declare his gift of salvation to her. I realized that as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, my ultimate goal is to please God and to give glory to his name by abiding and remaining in him. I praise God for such an unconditional love. To these, to our sovereign and almighty God, honor and thanksgiving, praise and adoration, now and forevermore. Amen. Praise to God. Thank you, thank you, Edith. Thank you so much. Can I please call Nanette to come forward? Nanette is the Bible discipler, the degroup leader of, uh, of Edith. And you know, having a, a discipler really helps you as you go through these struggles in life. And... Uh, it's something I encourage all of you to have a small group with a disciple taking care of you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Could you lift your right hand as a symbol of praying with one heart? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the healing, the restoration, the reconciliation of the relationship of Edith with her sister-in-law. We thank you, Lord, that you were the one who brought this all together. And we know, Lord God, that without true forgiveness, there will constantly be bitterness, unrest in our hearts. We thank you for settling this matter once and for all. And we pray that their relationship continues to grow in the coming weeks. Lord, we pray that uh, Nanette would continue to be able to disciple Edith in a way that she grows in her faith and her love for you. Thank you so much for the relationship with each other. And Lord, we just pray for all of us that if there's anyone in our lives today who we have issues with of unforgiveness and bitterness, may we, Lord God, by your power and grace, reach out to them and seek forgiveness. We thank you, Lord God, that this is possible. And we pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, our model of love, the application is this. Fill our hearts with the agape love of God so it will naturally overflow to others. Think about that. When you allow God's Niagara Falls of love pour into your life, there will just be an overflow that will naturally happen. It won't be something you force. It will be just a natural reaction of loving others, responding to them with the love of God. Amen? So, did you learn something today? Love is action. Our motive of love and our model of love. Let me close with the poem that I wrote for you. It's entitled, Love is Action. Love, God's beacon forever bright. His will to make relationships right. Feelings pull us back from taking action. Knowing his way leads to satisfaction. Patience, kindness, our hearts may resist. Only by your grace, your Holy Spirit will assist. Thinking more of others is right and true. It leads them to you, a life brand new. Forgiveness is so hard. My pain is real. And yet you forgive me each time is so unreal. 
I look to the cross and see true love on display. Arms outstretched, blood flowing, I look away. How could you die in gruesome agony for me, a wretched sinner who deserves eternal penalty? Your act of mercy and grace will forever be marked. A moment in time where true love was sparked. In your love's embrace, we find our peace. All pride, hate, anger, jealousy finds release. If your love in action through us draws others to you, we will choose to love them with eternity in view. Praise be to God. Let's join our hearts and pray. Father in heaven, as we've listened to your word, we realize that you are love itself. You are everything about love. And our prayer, Lord God, is that we would live the example of your love in our lives. That from this day forward, Lord, we would be sensitive to your spirit to allow your spirit to take over so that your love will naturally flow from us. I pray for all the relationships that are strained, that are broken, that are happening today that you know is not peaceful, is not settled. Lord, only you can do this. And I pray that our hearts are ready to step out in faith and to live this love for you. I know, Father, that today there are those who are here for the very first time and they've heard this message and they realize that they need a relationship with you. It's not about religion. It's all about relationship. And I pray, Father God, that you have spoken to their hearts. And friend, if you want to make your relationship right with God, if you want to commit and surrender your relationship to God right now, pray this prayer with me. But make it your prayer to God. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you, admitting that I'm a sinner. I have no excuse for my sins. I thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on, in my place. I thank you, Father, that I have hope of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus Christ. Today, right now, I surrender my life to you. I give up my all, and I ask you to take over my life. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, that you accept me as is where is with all my failures and sins. And you will cleanse me and you will restore me. You will refresh my life, Lord. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your love and for your gift of eternal life. Lord God, there's nothing greater than knowing that you will be walking with me from this day forth. I love you, Lord. And may my life be a journey of getting to know you more, loving you more, and even serving you more. Thank you, Father, for this gathering today. May our hearts be one, one in love. Thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' most precious and powerful name. And everyone said amen and amen. Glory to God. I love you guys.